Well, welcome to Ignite Church. Uh, my name is Pastor Jody. I'm the lead pastor here at Ignite Church. And uh, visitors, we're so, so well uh, thankful that you came. Uh, we know that God sent you here for a reason, and uh, I hope it is that you will hear the Word of God and that it will uh, impart into your heart that uh, it will not return void, and you will be able to use it in your life uh, and around your family and those that come into contact with you. That is what the gospel is all about. Did you guys notice we changed the seats around again? Just so you guys who came from the Baptist denominations don't get stuck in your seats, you know, like you know, 45, 50 years you get stuck in your seats, you know, you can't get out of it, and that's my seat, and we lose visitors over it, so we mess you up quite a bit uh, by doing that. So uh, doesn't the church look great? Yeah, it looks really good. They did a great job. Yeah, they did a great... I feel like I'm in the jungle right now, but other than that, it feels pretty good. $15, okay? I want these gone by the end of the day. Go to the ladies' ministry, get them off the pulpit here, so I'd appreciate that. Uh, they do an amazing job. I thank you for uh, the, the crew that came together the Christmas night, and we decorated and had a great time. Had a great time this week with our candy cane, or not, I keep saying candy cane, gingerbread house making. We had over 100 people here making gingerbread houses. Uh, this place was packed. We had coconut all over. The, that was the snow. It was all over the floors and the chairs, and um, thank you guys for having a great time. It was fun. So as we get into uh, Christmas season, we're going to talk about Advent. How many of you know what Advent is? Okay. Um, if you came from the Catholic background or Lutheran background, uh, you may have heard more about Advent than you have if you came from an evangelical background. However, Advent is really an early church tradition. It's not necessarily biblical, but it is a tradition that we look for the coming of Jesus. Um, and there's two types of Advent. Number one, the coming of Jesus as baby Jesus, and then the coming of Jesus as Lord and Savior, ruler of the world, judge and um, uh, our righteous king. And so when you think of Advent, there are may, a couple different ways that you may think of it. And so as we expand into this, I kind of want you each Sunday to try to forget about the worries of the world. Amen. For many of you, uh, you probably heard my stories about me not liking Christmas, okay? Um, I love Christmas, okay? I love the story about Christmas. And over the past few years, I've been pondering why I really don't necessarily like Christmas, and I think it goes back to my childhood and, which everything goes back to my childhood in most cases, but goes back to my childhood and my early adult life when Nan and I were married uh, together. We have spent most of our Christmases, my parents were divorced and remarried, and so were my wife's. Um, growing up as a kid, I would literally go somewhere Christmas Eve somewhere Christmas morning, somewhere Christmas afternoon, somewhere Christmas night, and then again somewhere on Christmas, the day after Christmas. That literally was my childhood from the time that I was, gosh, five years old till uh, Nan and I were married in two, or 2000, uh, 1990, sorry, 1990, and all the way up till we had kids. And after we had kids, we said, we're not traveling ever again. And so we, you know, if you want to come to our Christmas, you're more than welcome to. And so I, the busyness that has always been in my life made me not like Christmas. I love Christmas Day, but I hate getting up to Christmas. And after becoming a Christian in 2003, I started realizing that Christmas itself, the holiday that the world celebrates, was missing the most important piece, and that was Christ. Uh, the more that I got to understand the Word of God, the more that I dived into what Scripture was saying, the more that I understood that Jesus is the only reason for the season. Jesus is the only reason that we have hope. Jesus is the only reason we have love. Jesus is the only reason that we have peace. Jesus is the only reason that we have salvation. And so many times we get into this mindset that everything about Christmas is about the stuff and the getting together. I, I meant we're one week into Christmas. How many of you are already busy, like extremely busy? Okay, raise your hands. Anybody? Okay, 
most everybody is already extremely busy. And the closer we get to Christmas Day, it's only going to get worse. So each Sunday, I want you to come in here. For the next four weeks, we're going to talk about um, the reason for the season is Jesus. We're going to spend and focus all of our energy and effort on Jesus this day. So maybe it will give you enough juice to get you throughout the week without being exhausted and forgetting about all the good things that Jesus means about this season and not the presents and not the sales and not the food and not the family and all of that. Not that those things are important, but we're, we're missing the complete reason for itself, which is Jesus. So Advent is a... A kind of a liturgical word that we use for really the coming. And it is, it is something that gets us in the mindset to understand who Jesus is. It's much like the church. If the church gets out of balance with Jesus, we kind of miss everything else. If we don't stay unified in Christ and Christ alone, and we get so caught up on all this other minutia that goes on in life uh, or in church sometimes, we are going to mess up the church. And we are messing up Christmas right now. It has become a um, consumerism type holiday. And we've got to be really careful with not um, putting our focus back on Jesus. Now, um, Advent Advent itself, again, can become a tradition uh, or doctrine because it is a tradition. Much like the things that we do here at Ignite Church... I don't ever want anything, and the elders don't want anything ever to become, that is a tradition, become doctrine. Does that make sense? Anything that becomes a tradition can a lot of times become doctrine, and it's not even biblical. Now, we don't find Advent in the Bible. We do find the coming of Jesus in the Bible, and that's what we want to focus on. So for the next four weeks, we're going to talk about hope and love, peace, and joy. And how do we obtain those, and why exactly did Christ come, and why is Christ going to come back? Okay? Can we focus on those things? Amen? Amen. All right. So, let's, let, let's, let's begin this journey into hope. Today is going to be all about hope. And um, we see an angel come to the shepherds. And if you have your Bibles, open to Luke chapter 2, verse 8 through 14. And if you have them on your phone, open it up, turn it on, whatever you got to do. I read from the NASB, New American Standard Bible. It says, in the, na- in the same region there were some shepherds staying out in the fields and keeping watch over the flock by night. And an angel of the Lord suddenly stood before them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were terribly frightened. But the angel said to them, do not be frightened, for behold, I bring to you good news and great joy, which will be for all the people." For today in the city of David, there has been born for you a Savior, who is Christ the Lord. This will be a sign for you, and you will find a baby wrapped in clothes and lying in a manger. And suddenly there appeared an angel, with an angel, a multitude of the heavenly hosts praising God and saying, Glory, glory in his highest, and on earth peace among men with whom he is pleased. Our first point this morning is the hope of old promises kept. Now, could you imagine, like, an angel actually standing next to you, like, literally coming down and standing next to you? You're out there just tending sheep, and the next thing you know, you see an angel come to you. Every instance that you see in the Bible that an angel comes up to somebody, you know what the first words out of the angel's mouth are? Yeah, don't be afraid, you know, like, yeah, just an angel, you know, don't be afraid. But, like, every time that an angel comes next to someone, th- 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 I could only imagine the awe and wonder that is coming from the person who actually sees it. Like, he has to say, don't be afraid, you know, and maybe that calming voice or hearing his voice actually makes them not be afraid. But this angel, at the very beginning of uh, Jesus' birth, he's proclaiming who the Messiah is. He's excuse me, that's easy for me to say, proclaiming who the Savior is. And he's coming to these these shepherds, like what you see in the New Testament, you see this, this uh, accumulation of the angels and um, uh, Magi and all of these people coming together to really proclaim the glory of the Lord. And what we're going to see in Scripture today is that this has been prophesied all the way from the Old Testament. 
That's the cool thing about our Savior is that the promises that were made in the Old Testament were kept in the New Testament. So we have this amazing faith that should be built in in our lives when we see and understand um, the promises that were made, and we're going to look at each one of those here in just a second. The Old Testament was written um, about, the last book of the Old Testament was written about four to 500 years before the, new, the next book in the New Testament. And so you have this period of darkness that it was happening uh, in Jerusalem at that time. For years, or for thousands of years, they've been hearing, you know, God is going to come back. God is going to send a Messiah. And all of a sudden, there's this, the only time that they really got to feel sometimes the presence of God was each year that they would have the tabernacle, and God would sit and come sit up on the mercy seat, and he would have this opportunity to uh, proclaim uh, his love and his devotion to uh, Israel themselves. And so, All of a sudden, for 400 years, there hadn't been a word spoken to the Israelites. There was this darkness, and they, at this point in time, there was just probably this moment where they would just say, you know, that God that's up there, you know, you know, the God that says he's around here, but we haven't really seen much of him. Could you imagine the despair and the, the lack of hope that you might have in that moment? And then all of a sudden, in the New Testament, we see in Matthew and Mark, Luke, and John in the, um, in the Gospels, you'll see the description and the, the, the coming of the Lord. For 400 years, God had been preparing this moment to come up on the earth uh, as fully man, as fully God, to show the world who He truly was, to come face to face with humankind. For the first time in history, God Himself was here on this earth, and it was in the form of a baby in a manger. That's how our Savior came to the world. That's how our Savior came. He came in just like you and I, but He was fully God and He was fully man. Now in Micah chapter 5 verse 2, it says this, But as for you, Bethlehem, Ephrathath, um, too little to be among the clans of Judah, from you one will go forth before me to be the ruler in Israel, going forth, excuse me, His goings forth are from long ago. Now, this is, again, a prophecy that was placed, and it was specific. There was a couple of different Bethlehems at the time Micah was writing his book. And so he tells them exactly which one it was, and it's Ephrathath, um, Bethlehem. It's just right outside of Judah. So he's given a specific location, and this is exactly where Jesus was born. And this was written 400 years before Jesus actually came. Now, actually, I'm sorry, it was 700 years before he came. In Matthew 12, 17 through 21, it says this, This was to fulfill what was spoken through the Isaiah prophet. Behold, my servant, whom I have chosen, my beloved in whom my soul is well pleased, I will put my spirit upon him. I shall proclaim justice to the Gentiles. He will not quarrel nor cry out, nor will anyone hear his voice in the streets. A battered reed he will not break off, and a smoldering wick he will not put out until he leads justice to victory. And in his name the Gentiles will hope. And so now you see Isaiah also prophesying about who was coming. That was the Messiah well before he ever came. Now let's look at one more. I could spend literally all day just showing you the prophecy that was coming in in, out of the Old Testament, but I know you guys will get bored here in just a minute. So, Isaiah chapter 7, verse 14, Therefore the Lord himself will give you a sign. Behold, a virgin will be with a child and bear a son, and she shall call his name Emmanuel. Again, this was the promise to the nation of Israel. This was the promise to God's people at this point in time. And here the Messiah comes uh, in, a ba- in, in and through a baby, fully God and fully man. I think what we really need to think about is during this time is not, again, about the busyness of Christmas. Because we literally, I, I, I've watched, you know, when I was growing up, I watched my parents stress out about uh, the gift. And I can't imagine having a competing parent. Like, my parents were divorced. 
Uh, both of them were remarried, and my mom would buy me something, and she would wait anxiously for me to get back to talk about what my dad had bought, or vice versa. Like, there was this, this and it wasn't even, I don't even think they were trying to do it. It was just like, how do we, you know, make this child happy? And I had three brothers and a sister, so you could imagine what kind of chaos it was on Christmas. Um, and and in, in, in doing that, I literally see how we as adults and have, having kids, the kids go to school and they're talking about their gifts, they're talking about their presents, they're talking about all this. If you think about all the gifts that your kids get throughout the year, you know what Christmas should really be about is giving something away. Like, think about how much they really get. Like, I would wish we could change Christmas to where we're just giving stuff to those who don't have anything at, at all. Like, we have plenty, especially all the stuff that they get throughout the year. My point is, is that we cannot forget to focus on Jesus. And I'm not talking about just little baby Jesus. I'm talking about our Lord and Savior Jesus. I'm talking about the one who is going to give us hope. The ones, the, 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 for those who believe in Jesus Christ and now indwell with the Holy Spirit, have the hope of eternal life. That's the Jesus that I'm talking about. That's the Jesus that I'm talking about. And the Israelites have been waiting for centuries and centuries for the Messiah to come. And here he comes. Look at our point number two. The hope of new promises made. So we see the, the prophecy in the Old Testament. If you read the Old Testament long enough, and I would highly suggest that when you do start reading, because I know most people don't read, okay? You should be reading your Bible. But when you do start reading your Bible... You need to be looking at the Old Testament for Jesus. When you start looking for Jesus in the Old Testament, you're going to see him in Genesis chapter 1. You're going to see him all the way through the Old Testament, and you're going to see him all the way through the New Testament, all the way to Revelation chapter 22. You're going to see Jesus in everything. The story, the Bible, is God's love story to the world. And he loved us so much, what? That he gave his only begotten son. It is all about Jesus. And Christmas is all about Jesus as well. The website, the, there's a website called Statistic Brain, and it uh, tracked the must-have Christmas gifts for the past few decades. In 1983, everyone had to have a Cabbage Patch doll. Is anybody old enough to remember those crazy little things? I mean, kids were getting killed over that thing. Like, the parents were beating each other up, and like, it was crazy. And that was the ugliest doll I've ever seen in my life. In 1985, everyone had to have an $18 pound puppy. Um, I think I was a little old too then. I don't remember those. Um, 1989, American households scrambled to get the new Game Boy. Now, I did have one of those because I got one when I was in the Army. That way I could play when I was goofing off of that. That was a cool thing. Uh, followed by the 1995 Beanie Babies. Everybody remember the Beanie Babies? 1996, anybody can guess what that is? Elmo. Or, or Elmo. Yeah, Elmo. Seriously? Elmo. Tickle me Elmo. That was the dumbest thing. The tickle me elbow. Elmo is what it was. Um, then in 2002 was the iPod. In 2006, the Wii. 2010, the Kindle. Uh, Angry Birds came out in 2011. Doc McStuffins in 2013. And the Frozen Sing Along Elsa Doll in 2015. Trends come and go. Like, literally, within a month of getting those gifts, they were probably in a corner, and the kids were playing with the boxes that they came out of. We tend to forget Jesus in these moments. Amen. We tend to, to, to spend so much effort on trying to obtain these things that we literally forget Jesus. And how, in a, how does the world get to see Jesus? They, they get to see it in and through us. God has, has placed us here, those who believe in Jesus Christ, to be the messengers for everybody else. And when they see the church and they see the Christians to go out and do the exact same thing that they're doing, they don't see Jesus at that point in time. Now, don't get me wrong. I am not saying that there's nothing wrong with buying a gift for your, your kids. I, I'm not saying that at all. I'm saying, what is the intent? What is the heart behind it? Do we miss everything else in that moment? Um, for my family, this is what we do. We buy our, get, our kids three gifts, just like Jesus got. 
They get three gifts, and that's all they get because they do. And we, and we explain this to them because they, we do know that they are spoiled rotten. I mean, I can smell them from here, and I don't even think any of them are here today. Like, they are spoiled rotten. They get all this stuff throughout the year. There's no reason for us to focus so much on the gifts of Christmas. We do enjoy the time of uh, getting together. We do enjoy the time of we literally just sit around the house and, and, and eat and have a good time and love each other. And, and um, that's what Christmas is supposed to be about. But the rest of the world needs to see that the church is different. Again, I'm not, I'm not pounding the, the, the idea that buying gifts is wrong. I'm just saying the focus sometimes can be very wrong. The one gift that we need to be focusing on, the one gift that is eternal, the one gift that will not become a trend and has not for the last 2,000 years is Jesus Christ. Amen. John three sixteen, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. And we remember a few weeks ago, we were talking about the word begotten. Begotten is a, a special child, a special son, one that's unique, that is, is given for a purpose. Um, uh, I, uh, um, Abraham and Isaac. Isaac was a begotten son. Jesus was a begotten son. And, he, and God gave us his begotten son that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. And this is a promise of eternal life. This is the present promise that you and I have for those of us who believe in Jesus Christ by faith. Just so you know, you're not saved by your baptism. You're not saved by your... Uh, denomination, you're not saved by your church attendance, you're saved in and through faith and faith alone. You become saved when you, by faith, believe that Jesus Christ, born of a virgin birth, prophesied thousands of years before, walked a sinless life, willingly walked upon the cross, died, buried, resurrected, and is coming back. When I believe that by faith, again, I have to have faith to believe that, because I wasn't there, I didn't see it 2,000 years ago, and I'm learning to read my Bible, so I'm, I'm starting to understand it, but it's by faith that I believe that I'm indwelled with the Holy Spirit, I now have the promise of eternal life. Amen. And eternal is a long time, just so you know. Eternal life. Not death, eternal life. First Peter chapter 1, verse 3 says, Blessed be the God and the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who according to his great mercy has caused us to be born again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. Without a resurrected Savior, we have no salvation. We have no hope of eternal life. We believe, because Scripture tells us, that Jesus Christ was crucified willingly. He hung up on a cross. He died. Physical death. He was dead. It wasn't faked. It wasn't anything like that. He was put into a tomb, which was also prophesied. Tomb was sealed. Roman soldiers. Nobody could get into that tomb, but three days later, that tomb was opened up, and Jesus wasn't there. Here's the crazy thing, though. For 40 days, he walked the earth in a new body. Same body, I should say, but it wasn't beaten, battered, and bruised. He just had the hands in his, in his hand, holes in his hands and his feet. And for 40 days, he prepared his apostles and those that were continuing to walk with him on what to do when he leaves. And at the end of 40 days, he ascended into heaven, promising that he will come back. Amen. Doesn't know the hour, the time, or the day, but he is coming back. We have that hope. And in a day that we're believing in hope, like, man, the world is hopeless right now. Amen. <laughs> Seriously. Have you looked at the news long, very long? I mean, it is, there, there is a world out there that is dying right now because they have no clue what tomorrow is going to bring. They have no clue if, if this pandemic or, or financial crisis or... Uh, China, Russia, whatever is going, to, like there is a lot of hopelessness going on right now, and we have hope. No matter what happens to us, guess what? We're going to heaven. Amen. If I die right now, you know, get struck by lightning or trip over these poinsettias or whatever, I'm going to heaven. That's my hope. Amen. That's a promise from God. 
Because of my faith in Jesus Christ, His Son, the begotten Son, the one and only Son, my Lord and Savior, died, buried, resurrected for me, for you, I have eternal life in heaven. I don't have anything to worry about. I don't need to worry about the stock market. I don't need to worry about my 401k. I don't need to worry about my finances. I don't need to worry about China or Russia or whatever. I don't need to worry about that because I have hope in Jesus. And that's a promise from God. Romans chapter 15, verse 13, it says, Now may the God of hope fill you with all the joy and peace in believing so that you will abound in hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. I try to teach you guys to read your Bible every single day, to live it out, okay? Because the hope that I'm trying to to get you to have is all right here. And it comes through the power of the Holy Spirit. When you're filling being filled with the Holy Spirit over and over and over and constantly, I'm telling you what, your hope grows and grows and grows. I don't have any fear. I, I really don't. I, I fear the scale every morning I get on it, but other than that, I, I don't have any fear, especially of eternal life. If eternal life and being born again weren't enough, we were promised that the Holy Spirit will empower, empower us in this life. The reason that Christians are not focusing on Jesus Christ is because we're quenching the Holy Spirit. God promised us He would give us the power to get through this world, okay? This world is going to be, it's going to, it's scratching and clawing at your life, just so you know. But I have that power to be able to walk through it with, with, with hope. I don't have to worry about any of the things that are being thrown at me. Amen. Literally, I don't have to worry about them. Do I? Unfortunately, yeah, I do sometimes. I get in this stuff called flesh. I hate when I get in the flesh. Romans 8, 6, for the mindset on the spirit is life and peace, but the mindset, excuse me, for the mindset on the flesh is death, but the mindset on the spirit is life and peace. Don't you want life and peace? Allow the Holy Spirit to indwell in you. Allow the Holy Spirit to well you up. Allow the Holy Spirit to, to, to prompt you to be bold in your stance of your hope in Jesus Christ. Number three, the hope of the future promised revealed. The hope of the future, excuse me, hope of future promises revealed. Christmas hope takes us from the time that the shepherds and the birth of Jesus to the present and then into the future. God's promise from the past were proven, proven true as well as the promises that we are enjoying now. The cool thing about being a Christian is I can look at the promises that God placed in the Old Testament, and then I can look at the promises that He's placed in the New Testament, and I can see all the promises that He has kept. There's one promise that we're waiting on, and that is the return of Jesus Christ. We are still anxiously waiting. We, should, we still should be ready and waiting. Do you realize that our military spends every waking hour being ready for an invasion? Literally, every waking hour they spend waiting on something to potentially happen or to potentially have to go do something. They're literally waiting. They're anxiously waiting. And for those who have been trained uh, in combat, they are, I mean, they are, those are the last guys you want to deal with. They are really anxious. They are really waiting. They, they really want to do something because that's the way they've been trained. As Christians, we should be just like our, our military. We should be anxiously waiting for Jesus, meaning that I shouldn't be complacently sitting around doing nothing as a follower of Jesus Christ. I should be actively waiting on Jesus Christ. I should be discipling. I should be evangelizing. I should be giving. I should be serving. I should be doing something until Jesus comes back. Anxiously. Like, I'm doing, like, you know, the, I have this, this uh, thought all the time. I'm like, I'm hoping, I'm going, man, do you know Jesus Christ? And all of a sudden, here Jesus pops up, like, bam. That's how I want Jesus to come back, like, as I'm witnessing to somebody. Like, that's what I hope that happens when I'm, when I'm doing that. I hope it's not me sitting on the couch flipping teeth, you know, like, that's what I hope doesn't happen. Amen? All right. So, our hope is in Jesus. A group of Americans were surveyed concerning issues life after death. Now, this is an older survey. It's a, it's a Barna study. I, look, I do a lot of Barna studies because 
I think it kind of gives us the flavor of what's going on in culture right now. And this, this survey was done back in 2007, and it's not even close. Just in the last 13, 14 years, I believe, and I don't know the numbers, but I believe these are probably not even close to the numbers that I'm getting ready to give you, um, just in a uh, 14-year period. A group of Americans were surveyed concerning issues life after death. 10% believed we will return to the earth in a different form. That's a form of, um, thank you, reincarnation. It takes a church to preach a sermon. Reincarnation. They're going to come back, you know, either better than they were or they're going to go back to a rat, you know, that they came from. So 10% people believe that. 10% believe there's no life after death. It's just poof, unplug the, the cord and everything's over. That's where I used to be as an atheist. I believe that, you know, when we die, we just kind of fade away. It's just over. And as a Christian, my heart breaks for those people. Amen. Like, how hopeless of a life is that to think that, man, when this is all over, like, why would I want to go through this kind of chaos to, like, just be done with it? Like, that, that makes no sense to me. 10% of people surveyed. So if you expand that around the world, imagine how many billions of people that is. 24% believe the soul lives in a different place determined by past actions. They don't know heaven or hell or it's kind of this works-based um, theology that the better that I am, you know, the better of a place I will live, the worse that I am, uh, the worse. So there's like these levels of happiness, I guess, for eternity. 48% believe that we go to heaven or hell depending on confessions of the sin and accepting Jesus. I do believe now that probably has dropped substantially, just in 15, 14 years. I don't know the numbers, but just based on society, the moral capacities that we no longer have and how everything is okay and permissible, and this, this wasn't like that in 2007. The good news for us, well, and there's the 8%, there's 8% that didn't know or didn't care. And again, kind of a lonely place to be. The good news for us is that we don't have to rely on polls to know what happens after death. We don't have to rely on somebody's opinion. We don't have to rely on, you know, the what ifs. We have it in Scripture. We, as followers of Jesus Christ, believe that this is the errant, errant word of God. The inerrant word of God, meaning that it's, it's perfect. There's, there is nothing wrong with this. And when he says that I'm coming back, he's coming back. When he says that you have eternal life in heaven, for those who follow Jesus Christ, who believe in Jesus Christ by faith, are saved in Jesus Christ, I don't have to doubt that. Amen. I do not have to doubt that. And so if I, if I really believe in Jesus, everything is going to be great on the other side of death. Look at Romans 8, 18 through 25. This is a, a really cool section of Scripture. For I consider that the suf sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory that is to be re revealed with us. Paul is actually talking about, like, the sufferings that you and I are going to go through the good, the bad, the ugly, and there's no one that gets out of this alive, just so you know. Amen. We all die. What Paul's talking about is that his complaints aren't worth sharing to the rest of the world because of what is going to happen when he passes this life. The glory that's been revealed to him, that's going to be revealed to, revealed to him, like there is no reason to worry or complain or, 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 or live in fear because he knows what's coming next. Verse 19, For the anxious longing of the creation waits eagerly for the revealing, revealing of the sons of God. Since the Garden of Eden, Adam and Eve did, disobeyed God. God gave them one command. That moment, sin entered the world. The moment that they ate of the, the, the tree of knowledge, good of evil, good, the knowledge of good and evil, sin entered the world. It entered the world, not just humankind. It entered the world. 
trees started. Like, they were living in a garden that they could have eaten for forever and never had to plan anything. But now we have to cultivate it. We have to grow it. We have to do all that because everything dies. Creation is waiting for Jesus Christ to come back. Because when he does come back, all things will be made new. All things will be made right. We will go back to that same semblance of the Garden of Eden. Perfection. No more death. No more sin. No more sorrow. No more worry. And Paul knew this. Verse 20. For the creation was subject to futility, not willingly, but because of him who subjected it, in hope that the creation itself also will be set free from its slavery to corruption into the freedom of the glory of the children of God. For we know that the whole creation groans and suffers the pains of childbirth together until now. And not only this, but also we ourselves, having the first fruits of the Spirit, even, our, even we ourselves grown within ourselves, waiting eagerly for our adoptions as sons, the redemption of our body. For in hope we have been saved, but hope that is seen is not hope. For those who hope in all, what they already see, excuse me, for who hopes in what they've already seen? But if we hope for what we do not see, we perseverance, with perseverance we wait eagerly for it. Are you waiting eagerly for the return of Jesus Christ? Amen. He's coming back. Whether you want him to or not, whether you believe he is or not, he's coming back. And the Bible says that every knee will bow. And at that point in time, it will be too late if you have not accepted Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. And we don't know the hour, we don't know the day, we don't know the time, but we do know that he is coming back. And when he comes back, it will be as judge and juror. When he comes back, he will separate the sheep and the goats. And it's going to be a day of reckoning, so to speak. And Titus chapter 2, verse 13 says, Looking for the blessed hope and the appearing of the glory of our great God and our Savior, Jesus Christ. God has always been a God of hope. And his children, and as his children, we are the people of hope. Does the rest of the world see that? There should not be a grumpy Christian. Amen. Seriously. Man, you should have a smile on your face. You should not have a frown on your face. No matter what's going on in your life, the hope that you have in you through the power of the Holy Spirit, knowing that Jesus Christ is coming back and you're going to have eternity in heaven should never put a frown on your face. We have to stop living in the flesh. Amen. Too many of us are living in the flesh and not in the Spirit. The power of the Holy Spirit was given to us. Jesus even said to his apostles, he's like, listen, you don't want me to stay. You want me to send who I'm going to send. I'm going to send the Holy Spirit. And because of him, you're going to be able to do more than I could do. Collectively. Isn't that amazing? We have that power in us. We've got to stop quenching it by living in the flesh, by living in sin, by living in fear, by living in doubt. We need to live in the hope of eternity. We need to live in the hope of Jesus Christ. We need to live in the hope of Christmas. Amen. When we do that, I'm telling you what, the rest of the world will come running. What they see right now is a hopeless church. And we have to give them that hope. Much like death, I've done a lot of funerals um, as a pastor. And it's, there's this one moment, you know, in a funeral that you can just look out in the crowd and you can see that everybody is pondering death at that point in time. They haven't thought about death at all, ever. Like, they're all of a sudden, they're thinking, man, what, you know, what happened to the person in the casket? Or, you know, what, what's going to happen to me is, you know, looking around, or is this many people going to be here for my funeral? Or, like, all of these questions are going, and that's the moment that I share the gospel. Because the hopelessness that they have right now, the questions that they have right now, 
is that they don't know for sure, but I share the gospel and I hope that a seed is planted and that they give their lives to the Lord. Christmas is much like that right now. There are a lot of people looking into the season. Right now it's just lights and trees and flash and glitter and presents and all of that. But there is this moment where everybody just kind of really focuses just a little bit on Jesus, a little bit on Christmas, that, you know, the baby in the manger was Jesus, this little bitty small moment, and their hearts are open just a little bit, and this is a great opportunity for the church to come inside just a little bit and share the gospel, to share the hope that you and I have. How many of you are hopeful that Jesus Christ is coming back? Don't you want the rest of the world to know that? Amen. It is up to us to go out and to be the messenger. It is us to go out and to be the hopeful one. It is us to be out and to the one to go out and say, listen, Jesus is the only reason for this season, and Jesus is the only way. If you want hope for eternity, believe in Jesus. Billy Graham said, our world today is so desperate our world today so desperately hungers for hope yet uncounted people have almost given up there is despair and hopelessness on every hand let us be faithful in proclaiming the hope that is in Jesus my challenge to you today is we literally have what is today the 5th today the 5th okay we have 20 days till Christmas. You will be in stores. You will be in grocery stores. You will be at work, and Christmas will be kind of the spirit. I want to challenge you to share the same hope, to share the hope that you have with the people that are in your sphere of influence. I will never meet those people, but God has placed them in your life for a specific reason. The evangelist or the, the person who knows the Bible is not going to meet those people. You are going to meet those people. And you have to share the hope that is in you. That's why it's imperative that you understand who Jesus Christ is in and through you. That your hope is a, a man that you didn't see 2,000 years ago, but he changed your life. 2003, I gave up my own hope and gave my hope in Jesus Christ, and he wrecked my life Amen. in a good way. I lost everything that I thought that I had loved and made me a man and gave me the pride that I had, and I lost all of that for the hope of Jesus Christ. And it was a good thing. And I want the world to know that it can change your life too. Are we anxiously awaiting Jesus coming back? Are we anxiously giving the hope that we have in Jesus to the rest of the world? Man, we should be excited about the season. We should be excited about who Jesus is. We should be excited about our eternity. Literally excited. Can you guys get excited this season? Amen. Amen? Don't let the worries of the world get a hold of you. Don't let the commercialism get a hold of you. Don't let the, the stress get a hold of you. Let the Holy Spirit well up in you. So you can share the hope of Jesus to the rest of the world. That's what Christmas is all about. So for the next four Sundays, we are going to talk about Jesus. We are going to talk about Jesus. We are going to talk about Jesus. And I pray, my prayer for our church right now is that we are anxiously awaiting for Jesus. Anxiously awaiting for Jesus. That we are just, I mean, we are prepared I want to go when I'm reading my Bible or presenting the gospel or serving somebody who's homeless. Like that's, I want to anxiously await for that. And that's what the church should be doing. And we don't want to get caught just doing nothing. Amen? Amen. So Christmas is about what? Jesus. Christmas is about what? Jesus. There we go. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, Lord, um, I just thank you for this opportunity to, to come to you today uh, together as a church, Lord, and just focus on you. 
Lord, the power that you've given us in and through the power of the Holy Spirit, Lord, I just pray right now that we can just feel it just welling up in us, Lord. Lord, that 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 he, the Holy Spirit, will convict us of our sins. Lord, that he, the Holy Spirit, will motivate us. Lord, that he, the Holy Spirit, will give us the words to speak when we're in doubt. Lord, let us not live in fear of the pandemic or finances or the world's worries, Lord, because our hope is in you and our hope is in eternity with you. We have nothing to fear. Lord, I pray right now as the, Lord, that we will just tune out the noise of the world, the commercials, the social media, the, the commercials, Lord, that we will just stop focusing on those and that we will focus on you. Lord, more importantly, I pray that we, we teach this to our kids, Lord, that we pass down traditions of, of focusing on you during this season more than we do the presents, more than we do the... The, 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 the getting together and the eating and the buying stuff, Lord, I just pray that we just focus more on you. Lord, I pray right now that you'll just give us a, a heart of hope that the rest of the world will see. Lord, I pray if there's anyone here who does not know you, that they will stop running, Lord, that by faith they will just cry out that they believe in you, Jesus. The Bible tells us for those who believe by faith and confess with their mouth, they shall be saved. Lord, I thank you for that. Lord, we love you. We thank you. In Jesus' name we pray. And all God's people said, amen. amen.